share a bit of my life uh, with you guys and where uh, the Lord has taken me on this journey of worship. And, and um, it's so interesting, you know, I, I started leading worship when I was 12 years old. Which means I've been doing it, uh, you do the math. Uh, I'm terribly <laughs> doing math. So it's been a while. Uh, and the worship world that I was raised in, that I was brought into, is very, very different than the one that you guys are, have been raised in. And, and it is, uh, as, I, as I wrote in the book, I'm like, it's a day of fulfilled dreams. You know, it's like we used to dream about a day when worship would be as front and center as it is in the church. Like worship leader degrees, that was like, are you kidding? What is that? You know, no one had a grid for that kind of thing. I mean, worship, when I was growing up, uh, particularly in the First Baptist Church, uh, worship was, uh, there was a choir director, there was an organ, and it was turned to page 363, and everybody just started singing. And, you know, but that was, the, that was the extent of worship leading. And it's really moved and progressed and opened up and Evolved, if I can use that word, so much, and our understanding and our revelation around it has changed so much um, within, you know, over the past 30, 60 years, really. Um, and it's pretty, pretty remarkable. And I just wanted to share a bit of my life, and, and I want to, to do so um, in a way that hopefully just opens up questions. I know everyone has questions, and, and I'm not terribly good at being practical. I'm a heart guy. To me, worship is way more about a posture. Uh, than it is about a practical skill set, but I do absolutely think that practical skill sets are essential. If you can't maintain uh, pitch, um, you're going to have a hard time leading worship, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. So I, I don't mean to diminish that. I just feel that first and foremost, worship is about the heart. It's about understanding who you are as a priest before the Lord. It's about understanding um, the heart of God and, um, and His worth. So, um, I, so I'm just going to move through much content I'll be able to cover, but I'm just going to move through a bit of my journey, my life journey in worship, and, and how that unfolded, how I found myself here, and all that good stuff, uh, beyond what was covered in that little bio there. But I grew up in a Christian family, Christian home, um, I'm the second born out of seven kids, which is uh, impressive on my parents' side. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and I first probably learned about worship from my parents. Anyone else have parents that imparted something to you in the area? I remember waking up, um, you know, just as a kid, my life, my dad had such a remarkable devotional life with the Lord. And uh, you don't know how that is teaching something in you. You know, you don't know how that's instructing you, how your parents live a life of worship before God. But it is probably to this day one of the most powerful things. It's like my dad's personal devotional life. He never led worship for probably more than 30 people in his entire life. But every morning from 4 or 5 in the morning, I would wake up, come out of a slumber, and I would hear my dad howling away in some corner of the house in worship to the Lord. And I know for a fact that the freedom that I move in today, the, 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 you know, it's like his, his ceiling was absolutely my floor in terms of what I was able to step into because of the foundation that he laid with his devotional life. He was my David. <laughs> he was the one that, that, I, that I listened to. And it was super controversial in my parents' marriage, how loud my dad was at 4 a.m. Um, <laughs> so my dad had this solution. He was going to get a keyboard and just plug it in with just his headphones. Uh, and and he was, that was going to be super quiet. But the problem was, it's like, if you guys ever know what a keyboard sounds like, a weighted keyboard that's just plugged in, it's like... <laughs> you know, it has that kind of noise. And so my dad would still sing at the top of his lungs. But all you could hear without any music was this, <laughs> you know, just howling. And, uh, it was very weak. But, uh, but I loved it. It was pretty formed, you know. So my parents were saved in the Jesus movement. They carried, that was a powerful move of God that awakened something really, really deep and profound, and, and uh, particularly in their worship. Um, so uh, that was the first part of my life. I tried to learn an instrument. It didn't work out. I didn't love it. Um, I didn't really... Uh, pick up guitar until I was 12 years old. And I, would, I would say all of these things, guys, all these seasons that the Lord brings you through, they're all a form of school. Like the Lord has, has different schools that he takes you through, um, you know, in life. And I hope that some of you, as I just talk about this, you're able to identify, oh, oh, I think I'm in this school right now. I think the Lord is doing this in my heart right now. It's so important to 
to know the season that you're in, to know what the Lord is doing in your life, because when we don't know and understand what the Lord is trying to do in our lives, we oftentimes resist the very thing that He's trying to do, and it prolongs the season. So there's something about awareness, there's something about understanding what God is doing. And we have different language around that, like, oh, it's a season of hiddenness, and I have so much to say about season of hiddenness, but, and sometimes they are that, and sometimes they're not that. But, um, but I would say the first season that the Lord brought me through was discovering my gift, discovering a passion. It was a season where, where passion for something began to be unlocked. And for some of you guys, you know, you, you've had this experience. You know something, you're here, you're sitting in this pew because something in you became, came alive to this thing called worship. And, um, and, and you began to discover a gift that you might have in this area, and a passion began to be unlocked. And, for me, that was, as a 12-year-old boy, I, I tried music when I was seven or eight, and it didn't, it didn't take. <laughs> but then, for whatever reason, 12 years old, my mom had an old nylon guitar. I asked her if I could write a couple chords. She taught me uh, three chords and the truth, and uh, I was off to the races from there. For me, and at the time, you could play almost the entire worship catalog uh, <laughs> with those three chords. And if you threw an E minor in, you, were, you could literally play every song. <laughs> so... I, uh, and you know, it's one of those moments where, and you guys, I, I assume you felt this, that you, there's like a divine connection with something, where you're like, there's something otherly happening in this moment. Like when you discover something that you know you were actually like, why does this feel like I was born to do this? Why, why do I feel such a deep uh, affinity or something's happening? <clears throat> and as a 12 year old boy, I don't have that kind of language, but I knew something special was going on in my life and in my heart. And, um, and, uh, and then it just kept unfolding and unfolding, and, and I began to discover how it anointing, and people began to comment on, oh, you know, oh, you know, it's like, oh, you know, it just began to become something that people became aware of, you know, in my life. And um, all throughout high school, I always tried to be a part of the worship thing, um, was passionate about that. When you're young, you particularly just have this desire to be seen, <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, all the ways that we do that, that are super immature, but humorous and so human of us, you know, where you're just like, you're that person playing guitar when no one's really paying attention, you know, at the gathering, or, or you, you're drawing a little attention to yourself, you know, like, look what I can do, uh, kind of alone. <laughs> and uh, so all throughout, and people, I remember the time when I, I attended a home group, I don't know, there's, they, they go by so many different names, um, but I attended a home group, and I remember, um, you know, one time the worship leader didn't show up, and the home group leader's like, you're on. And I'm like 13 years old, you know, at this time. And I hadn't even hit puberty yet, guys. Like, my voice had changed. Uh, it was singing in the rafters. But somehow, people lived with it. And, and, um, and there was, I, again, I felt like, wow, I have something for this. So it's a, a season of discovery, you know? Um, that journey led me through so many different things. Um, uh, high school and all that good stuff. I fell into the black hole that many young adults fall into coming out of high school, and I fell into that for a lot of different reasons. Some of them are really funny, but I don't have time to go into it. Um, but I, but I, 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 I experienced a lot of pain. I experienced a lot of rejection, uh, from the church. I, I just some of it wasn't even dis, you know rejection so much, just disconnection. You know, I'm like, I, I, all right, I'm out of high school, but I don't really connect with the big church and what's going on there. And I have these passions, but it doesn't feel like I'll get a chance. And, at the time, my church had this philosophy. It's like, you want to be on stage, you need to set up chairs, you know, or that kind of thing. And, and I'm like, okay. And I bought into that for a while. And, and then I just watched. You guys watch the ladder you kind of have to climb in church? Anyone observed some of those things? Like, you got to set up chairs. you got to start serving. And then you get a chance to play acoustic guitar. It's more like air guitar. No one hears you, what you're doing. And you sit in the back. And, and you know, that, this, this, was, this was the ladder. And I looked at the ladder, and I go, no, thank you. The ladder's not for me. And... Um, and something, and particularly because of that rejection, and some of that is just, you know, rebellion, a little bit intermixed with that, trying to figure out um, I, what, what I was doing in life, what my purpose in life was. And, and a different kind of song began to come out of me. So I had this passion for worship all throughout high school, led worship all throughout high school, but something began to shift in my young adult years. And all of a sudden, partly because of heartbreak, the girl that I had a mad crush on, and then going out with my youth pastor right out of high school, and that is not fair, not fair at all. Uh, and that did not help me uh, in my relationship with the church. Um, but, uh, and so I began to write a different song. 
we had prepared a very different song, and it was not a Christian song, it was not a worship song, it was a heartbroken song, and and um, and music became this all-consuming thing for me. I just wanted to do it. I was like, this is what I'm burned for, this is my passion, and um, and it was really kind of a broken season. And so I moved from a season of discovering my gift to a season of sifting. I don't know if you guys have ever been through seasons where God has sifted. And, uh, and, and there are times of testing. There are times of, of uh, <laughs> many times there are times when we go off, we go off the rails. We, we go off in some ways from our intended course. <clears throat> and um, I, you know, I did that. I also love how God redeems those seasons. So and he's, he's powerful to do that. But um, but I did. I began to write largely what I consider to be mainstream secular songs. And, and a dream began to take over my heart of making it a mainstream rock and roll. Like church, small pond, small fish small fish. Like, I set my sights on something bigger. I had a massive drive for significance. And man, I, you two, I, you know, I was one of those homeschoolers that discovered you two like 15 years late, you know? And, uh, but when I did, it had the same impact, you know, for me. And um, I was just like, I, that's what I want to do. I want to be vulnerable. I want to do this. I want to. And, um, and, uh, and so I did. I chased it. I chased it hard. I, I, we were in Southern California at the time. I started a band I tried to make it in clubs and all that kind of a thing, and we had some traction, um, but never enough to actually really get anywhere, praise the Lord. Um, but it was a season of sifting for me, and the whole time I'm going through this season, I'm wrestling with the Lord, because there's a sense that there's a call on my life, and there's a sense that this isn't it, but at the same time, I really wanted this to be it. You ever have those moments where you're just trying to, like, spiritually justify a wrong pursuit? <laughs> because you've ever done that, or you're, like, bartering with God? Uh, trying to be like, Lord, if you make me famous, I'll make you famous, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it's definitely one of those uh, moments in my life. And, and the Lord doesn't bother. He does not bother with you. And um, so that season of sifting, of warfare, ultimately led to a season of surrender. And uh, for me, it was no small surrender. For me, that surrender, when it finally, I just, I can't go into the whole such an intense season, I just felt that, and I got in a massive argument with, you know, with all the people, and I remember meeting with pastors and just trying to find out what it really, really meant to try and follow the Lord in this, but at the end of it, all I could come to, the only next step that I could, could come to was I have to surrender everything, and I have to lay down everything, my dream for this, I, I, I laid down the music itself in this season, I, I didn't try to cling to anything, and um, this is where my life almost began. And I, I just want to, I'm not going to belabor this point of the much, but one of the things that I, that I just, I just want to say, if you want God to lay hold of your life, if you want to be used mightily by God, if you want your life to begin to take on this level of spiritual traction that it is yet to really carry, if you want your life to carry a level of spiritual weight and authority, uh, this is this, no one doesn't go through this. No one doesn't come to that place of absolute, full-on, outright surrender. Lord, you can have everything. Here are my dreams. Here are my desires. Everything. Everything. You have it all. And I, guys, I entered that season, and that was not a fun season for me. My band didn't understand that season. Uh, nobody really seemed to understand that season. And um, I was a little bit, I didn't understand that season, so I was visible in it, and I didn't understand it, but I was obedient to what I felt the Lord asking me to do. And in that season, guys, um, I began to pray, one of the most powerful prayer any human being can pray to the Lord, and that is not my will, but yours be done in my life. I surrender my idea of what my life is supposed to be, what my life is supposed to look like, and um, Lord, I am full on pursuit for the first time in my life. I'm seeking first the kingdom of God. And uh, that is revolutionary. That will change everything uh, about your life. That level of surrender will change everything about the course of your life. And, um, and I fought it. I resisted it for five years. And so when I finally do something, I do it with everything. Some of you guys are wired like that. Or you just give it. You're all like, okay, we're going to do surrender. I'm going all in. And now I'm going to do this whole this thing wholeheartedly. And what I began to discover is that is the gateway to a wholehearted life. It's the gateway where you deal with the division in your soul. You deal with the division in your pursuits. You deal 
with your half-heartedness towards the Lord and, 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 it, and all of the ways that that keeps your life from really taking off in the way that it's meant to take off. God has a plan and a purpose, but the pathway is surrender. And, um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say that. You will never know the full measure of your anointing in the area of worship apart from surrender. There is, there is a measure of anointing. There's a measure of spiritual authority, guys, you are made to carry, but you will never discover that apart from going, Lord, I am all yours. I don't consider my life to be my own. I don't consider my gift to be my own. I don't consider anything of, of, of my life to be my own. I consider my life to be a living sacrifice before me. It's like it's daily offered up to you. And guys, uh, surrender is not a one-time moment. It's not, it's not like an altar call to respond to, you know, and, like, good, took care of that. It is a daily uh, decision to live a life that is fully yielded to the Lord, to His Holy Spirit. And uh, the Lord is looking for holy, devoted vessels. And He sees, He's looking for people who are like, will you, will you give me everything? Will you give me your whole life? He's looking for it. He's searching the earth. And he's looking for the ones that, that are like, yes, 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 I will. You can have it all. <clears throat> Not just an extravagant lyric. But the real thing, we sing a lot of extravagant things that we do not live out. Lifestyle, lifestyle obedience, ongoing consecration. Um, guys, don't ever be concerned. There is a paradox, there's a truth about surrender. Jesus says, if you lay down your life, you'll find it. That's how this works. It's like, you know, I know there's all kinds of confusing theology right now. It's like, learn to dream with God. And I really believe in all those things. Don't, don't hear me even belittling them. But first, from a place of absolute all out surrender. Like, the Lord will be faithful to the promises over your life. The drives and things that he's put inside you, he's put them inside you for a reason. But you will not fulfill them. You'll make a mess of them. <laughs> Promise. And, uh, and, but if you yield yourself fully to him, he is far more committed to you coming into your full destiny manifest destiny, the purpose that's on your life, your full anointing, the weight that your life was intended to carry, the transformational power that your life was intended to carry. God is far more committed to that than you can possibly imagine, but it begins with yield uh, to him. So, all right. Next season, super weird, left turn. I was a political science major. I got my degree in political science. I was on that track to be, whoa, we have some poly soccer weird. Uh, so I, I, um, Christian, my phone. Oh, there's a clock, there's a clock, I'm here. Um, I don't have time to go into this, but uh, left turn, had no ambition for ministry whatsoever. Not, I was not going through your worship leadership degree programs of any, any kind. I was, I was going to become an attorney or a rock star. That was the two options <laughs> for me. So, um, and the Lord threw me a curveball. In that season of surrender, and I was offered a youth pastoral position. Now that is, you know, if you knew anything about me at the time, you'd be like, whoever offered you that job doesn't know what they're doing and should not have uh, hired you. But uh, they sensed the Lord on it, and I did too. And uh, it didn't make any sense to me. I did not have a passion for youth. I was no, <laughs> not, not your junior high, like, yes, I want to see them step into all that God had done. No, no, no. It did not exist. Uh, <laughs> But I knew it was the Lord. And, and, and so, um, first thing, I was given uh, very little responsibility. Thank, thank you, Lord. Uh, that first year of youth ministry, and I came into it, and uh, the very first thing that I knew that I had to do was I had to learn to read the Bible. <laughs> There's Pastoral 101, Pastoral Ministry 101. You should know the Word of God. I was not super smart at that time, but I knew that. I knew that much that you should really know the Word of God if you're going to wear this hat. So uh, I devoured the Word of God, and that's the next school that Guys, remember, God doesn't have a traditional way of shaping men and women who are after his heart. He has his own methods and ways of, of forming in you uh, all that he has. And sometimes it's just about obedience. It doesn't need to make sense. Guys, I wanted to be on the worship leader track. That's what I wanted to be on. I wanted to pursue that. And if, if I had allowed myself, I would have kept myself isolated to that kind of bubble. And the Lord wants to oftentimes expand you in a different area of gifting. And I remember the youth pastor who hired me just said, hey, I know you have a real strong anointing in music. I think there's something else on your life, and I want to see that develop. 
And you always pay attention to people who have that kind of prophetic insight into your life and what's on your life. So I entered a season where I devoured the Word. And I remember coming to this conclusion, guys, when it comes to the Word of God, that almost every issue in the church that exists, all the brokenness and failures within the church, they exist because people don't read the Word and they don't obey the Word. It's really honestly that simple. And if we would just read this book, it's there. I actually need it. You want to grab it for me real quick? We would read this thing and learn to obey it, to not just be hearers of something, but actually doers of it. Holy smokes, the church was revolutionized, turned upside down. Uh, because this is a radical book, and it will change your life if you engage it, not just thumb through it and get through your verse of the day. But if you engage this word, it will change your life. And it changed my life. Um, that was the next season. I don't, time will not permit, we won't get to Q&A. I really want to get to Q&A here. But for me to go into all the different things, the school of pastoral ministry is another massive thing. You know, and I'm really glad that the Lord interrupted the, the strictly musical track that I wanted to keep myself on because, guys, we need worship leaders who understand the heart of God for His church. We need worship leaders who understand where God wants to take His people. One of the very first things is, you know, before we get to all the fun stuff, the creativity and all that, we have to understand what God wants to do with His people. If you're going to lead God's people, if you're going to step into a place where you're accountable for how you lead his people, then you better know where the boss wants to take his people. You, you better know that you're not on a self-serving mission, but you're actually on his mission, that you're actually in partnership with him. It's a huge, huge deal. And I think the three things that I got out of the season of being a junior high pastor when I didn't want to be a junior high pastor <laughs> is I got a heart for God's people. I understood. I began to understand. And man, when you get a heart for God's people, it changes how you so I got a vision for his church. I saw the story of God from Genesis to Revelation. I got a glimpse of where he wanted to take them. Um, his desire to be among his people. God wants to be among his people. Right? He has not changed this. His city is going to come down and God is going to be right there in the midst. And oftentimes worship is characterized by an incredible distance when God wants to be like, hey, I want to come. These are holy times. You know, Israel had this constant encounter in the early days of coming out of Egypt where they lived around a cloud that would come down. And, they, and I, I, I want to go in this. I want to go after this just because we need, we need, we need a different kind of leader. A leader that reawakens what true worship is really about in the church. Um, three, and I don't have time to go into this, but I really began to understand the uh, there's no job description in scripture necessarily for worship leader. You know, you kind of have to kind of piece things together. Uh, maybe that, someone could argue with me on that. Uh, I would happily submit to your insight into that. But it's not like one of the five full gifts. It's not like apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist. You know, it's, it's, it's not like worship leaders in there. You know, it's not like it's laid out super clear, you know, in that, in that sense. But there is something weighty, there's something noble. There's a higher level, a much higher level of accountability that also comes with that as well as a glorious dignity, you know, to it. And I, I love, I, you know, I, I can't, I could run away with all these things. Um, school of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> this, is, this is one of my favorite schools, one of my favorite seasons. School of the Holy Spirit, the school of His presence, the school of His manifest glory. Uh, uh, some of you guys know uh, uh, I was a part of Bethel uh, Church, Bethel Music, uh, for about nine years. Well, I actually really only Bethel Music seven years because when I came to Bethel, there was no Bethel Music. It didn't exist. Jesus Culture was just coming on the scene. Kim Walker Smith was blowing everybody's minds. And, you know, and, uh, and so many people were descending. And so many worship people were descending on Bethel that season. And we were one of those people. Movements, and I'm not saying I endorse all the things in any way, shape, or form, but I learned some things there. I learned some things when it came to following the Holy Spirit that really transformed my work. 
for shift ministry. And before, I felt like I was clumsily stumbling around in the dark and very satisfied with leading the four or five songs. We get to lead and following. I'm like, oh, we transitioned so well. The band nailed that. That was so good. You know, and that was like the extent. I was so happy, pleased. And we did lunch afterwards, and I'm like, this is all there is. Man, did you feel the warmth in that moment? That was awesome. You know, it's like, that was that was the lid. That was as far as I got in my head. If you had ever told me that, I would say the cloud of the Lord come into a sanctuary after my birth You know, and I know some of you guys don't question whether that stuff is even real, but, and that's fine. I'm not here to convince you it is, except I saw it with my own eyes. And I saw it in a really, really crazy, crazy moment. I was leading into the Lord. And I'm not saying every manifestation on the internet is the Lord, okay? There are some ones that are really funny, and they were not the Lord at all. Uh, <laughs> I, I can't go into that time. But, uh, but that one, I watched the atmosphere in that room literally changed. I watched something where the whole air began to glitter. And I, I was just like, what's happening? It's not something you can manufacture. No glitter gun could have done that. No air conditioning vent. I've worked in air conditioning. I know how air conditioners work. <laughs> you don't. You could not manufacture it. It was a powerful thing, and it stopped around 2012, 2013. And I know it's happened in different other places. But also, if you manufacture that thing, you like to keep it going, too, because it, it creates momentum. And, uh, it was a holy, kind of sovereign thing, and I don't fully understand it. All I know is that encounter with this manifest glory, with his presence, and that's not the only one. But I've had many, but that thing began to rewire me with what is actually possible in the realm. When people seek the Lord with all their hearts and all their minds, and we, we have no idea the level of visitation that God wants to come. God wants to be God. God wants to be the talk of Southern California. God wants his fame and his glory on the earth, guys, and that's not just going to come through this typical ways that we've seen. It's not just block parties and charities and all these kinds of things. He is power. He is a God of power. He is a God of miracles. He's a God of signs and wonders. You can't study that book and not uh, understand who he is and the fullness and how he wants to break out and what he wants to do. And I'm longing for worship leaders who are leaning into the more, the more of God. And I'm going to close here because I don't have time to go on all the other schools. And I do want to get practical because it's a practical piece and I'm going to leave that open for Q&A uh, to some degree. Learning to follow the Holy Spirit changed how I led worship. It went from four songs and me thinking through, oh, this is going to rule as a set, to going like, actually, Lord, when you step in, um, this thing goes from a level three. It's about as far as my setless planning has ever been able to take this thing, is a level three. But when I follow you, we, we see five and six and sometimes seven and nine. You know, I, I don't know what ten is, you know, so I'm not going to pretend to to know how far we've gotten in this thing, but all I know is that when we follow the Holy Spirit, when we learn to hear and obey that, that small whisper, how that impression that the Lord gives, and some of you guys, God is speaking to you all the time, but you don't know it's Him, because you haven't learned to actually recognize His voice, and when you're in the middle of a worship moment, and God begins to speak, and you go like, okay, Lord, this may be you, this may be me, I don't know, but when you step out and you take a risk, and you watch a whole other dimension of worship open up to you, you're like, <gasps> There is more. And I just want to tell you now, there is more. But that more is accessed by a people who will learn to follow the Holy Spirit and to move, you know, outside of the set list. And, and uh, we have, there is a human power that we can always offer. And your, your gifting, your anointing, your voice all has a power. Your band has a power. Music has a power. But there is another power. And when you see that level of power, it ruins all the other things. It just goes, Lord, I I. John Wimber, he was the founder of the vineyard, he said this, the Lord said this to him. He's like, John, I've seen your ministry. I want to show you mine. And a lot of times I think we have seen our ministry. <laughs> We've seen the extent of what our voice can do. I've seen the extent of what all my brilliant planning can do. I want to see the Lord's ministry. And the only way you want to see the Lord's ministry is you become a vessel for that. You become someone who's like, okay, Lord, I am surrendered. And guys, I've just learned to jump off cliffs without thinking about it. And there's some wisdom that but there's a risk that you can never get away from. And I've had moments where I'm like, you know, it's like that Eminem song. It's a little old and dated. I'm dating myself here. But it's like, you know, knees something and mom spaghetti. You know, <laughs> what? I don't even know all that it is. But it's like when you're about to take a risk, you feel like this could be horrible. <laughs> like, this could be so disastrous. And uh, oh, I can't go into those stories. But, 
And some of them absolutely were. They were the worst thing in the world. They absolutely train wrecked the set. And some of those things, some of those things opened up a realm of heaven. Yeah. And that is what marked them to this day. I, I can't think about it without, you know, just being overcome because they really did in those moments. And uh, when you, you experience that, you're like, okay, Lord, your ministry is far superior to mine. And I want to see more of your ministry break out of here. And I want to become a vessel for that. And I'm going to read just a little scripture before we launch into Q&A, because I feel like there's an invitation. Guys, the world has experienced, particularly the worship world, they have experienced a tremendous level of talent, to trump, like, uh, like an explosion, an acceleration of creativity. We have some of the most talented people making worship music in our day. It's like it's gone from the dated, ancient, nerdy sound that your parents used to listen to, to something that is like moving culture. Like, it's, 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 it's a totally different age when it comes to worship, and we have seen tremendous talent, we've seen the level of songwriting, crafting, expertise explode, like people give their lives to write a worship song at a level that, that, that can be, you know, taken up and sung by the whole church, like they devote themselves to the craft, like that's, that's like unheard of, um, you know, in, in a previous day and age, and we have, we've seen all of these kinds of things, but what I want to say is that we haven't seen much of glory. There's a realm of glory, there's a realm of God that is still waits for a generation to tap into, for a generation of hunger. And the best thing that I got from, from particularly Bill Johnson, he had such a hunger for the glory of God. And, um, and that was the most forming thing. Again, not an endorsement. I'm just saying that there's something that he carried for a hunger. I've never seen a senior leader. They were always wanted to preach. They always wanted to do their thing. They were always driven by that kind of thing. And Bill would never allow a moment where God's presence was manifested to be interrupted. He has such a passion and a hunger for that. And I'm longing for a day where we care more about the presence of God in our gatherings than we do about executing our thing. There's such an obsession with just executing our thing in our programs. I'm like, where is the ones who will be hungry for God? Because I tell you, when God shows up, it shakes. It'll shake this university. It will shake this whole region. When God shows up, it shakes this city. And I've seen it. I've seen him do it. And I, I, I just want to... I want this passage on Moses and Moses' relationship with the Lord. It says, Now Moses used to take his own tent and set it up outside the camp, far away from the camp. And he called it the tent of meeting of God. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to this tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. It says this, Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise. So, 600,000 fighting men is what, is what we know. But that does include women and children and uh, any men who were not of fighting age. So they, they estimate that when Israel left Egypt, they were about 3 million strong. That's a conservative estimate. So this one man's relationship with God, when he would make this little solo journey to his tent of meeting, 3 million people would rise and watch. So it's, when Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise and stand, each at his tent door, and look at Moses until he entered the tent. Whenever Moses entered the tent, a pillar of cloud would descend, the love to my friend, and stand at the doorway of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tent door, all the people would rise and worship each at his tent door. And so the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. And I'll just leave this last little part. And his attendant, Joshua, the son of Nun, the next guy to lead the group, the young man, the young man would not depart from the tent. He was hungry. He saw that. He wanted that. He wanted that connection and that relationship with and there's something, guys, where if you will give yourself to be someone who meets with God, we do not live under that covenant. We live in a day and age where the veil has been torn and everyone has been given access to move towards the Lord, to build that kind of friendship with the Lord. And what we're desperately lacking is not necessarily all the crafting and the talent and the basketball, but people who are like, you are a friend of God. You meet with God. You know God. 
His Moses' very face began to be physically transformed. It said it shined in such a way that you get to wear a veil. Like, it was so evident. Three million people would watch this guy's daily devotions, and they would cause three million people to worship. It would cause their life to go up. Like, they would give themselves to that. If there's one thing, and that's not apart from this, because when you're in the glory, you're going to write songs that you will never write apart from this. You will move into power. You will see worship begin to rise at a level that is desperately needed, but it won't be humanistic. It won't be based on human talent. It will be full of his glory. And we need his glory in the church today. So that's where I'm going to close it out. I ten minutes here. Uh, just opening up a Q&A. I could just... Go off a list here, some great questions. Uh, let me just give a, just a moment for anyone, just a burning uh, question. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, how did you, when you were that student and you surrendered everything, what were things you did that helped you stay and, and stay with him in the sense of not run away or like not out on the ground? Like what about pride that you had to avoid that was in your way? How were ways that you stayed put and you didn't just like get to <laughs> I don't even remember all the way I, um, of how, how I pulled that off. I think it's the grace of the Lord, you know, it, you know, it, it worked in that. And some of that was I, I felt like what, what happened in that season, there was the initial surrender. There was a season of probably three to six months, I don't remember how long, where I just, I didn't really know. But I didn't move until it became clear what the Lord had next. And sometimes I think it's just, just don't prematurely create a plan that season when you know the Lord's moving, but the next thing hasn't emerged yet. But it doesn't mean you do nothing. It's not like I did nothing. I was going to school still. I was doing different things. I was engaging. Um, and then it was in that season where I was serving. I was serving. My wife and I just signed up to serve junior high. And that's where that whole thing began to emerge. And then out of that became, you know, I got a job offer and that, that I sensed was the Lord. So I think stay active in some, you know, area of service. Like, don't, it doesn't necessarily, um, and honestly, you have to know that you're supposed to lay everything down. Because there's the heart posture, you know, which we need, we need to hold in the whole life with everything that we do open-handed. But at the same time, for me, it was specific to the pursuit that I was on and the path that I was on. And I knew I had to lay that thing down, that that dream had to die. And that if the Lord was ever going to resurrect it, he was going to have to be the one to do it. And that, I knew that was a specific so don't, don't try and chop things off by yourself, okay? So make sure that's the Lord pruning you and not you pruning you. He does a great job. You will do a terrible job. So um, you will lop off things. He's like, I'm not asking you to lop that off, you know, and so on and so forth. So make sure that you're not the one lopping things off in your life, but the Lord himself is leading you in that. And there was also some counsel, some leadership that I was engaging with around that that helped me discern that process. So best way I can answer that question, a beautiful question, powerful. Anyone else? Yes. Um, when it comes to songwriting, is there a limit you have for yourself on how much of your own feelings you allow to a song? Rather than, so that way it's kind of like your song rather than song. You know, let me just say this <laughs> to, to this journey is, is don't try and be a professional worship songwriter right off the bat. Okay? Just go on a journey. The best thing about me pursuing, the most redemptive piece about me pursuing secular mainstream music was breaking, was finally being released of all the rules of how and, you know, the ways that we write worship songs and, and, and the worship songwriting craft and learning how to pour out an honest song. And honesty, again, honesty is the most abused thing in the church. And we do a lot of horrific, horrible, sinful things in the name of only just being honest. And I'm just like, no, you're just being absolutely immoral and broken and sinful. Okay, there's a difference between being honest. And I'm talking about honesty before the Lord. I'm talking about the justification of behavior in the name of honesty. And I'm not a fan of that. But I did think it was important for me to learn how to just not, like, edit, of like, what would the church say? Or will they adopt this? Or will they, will they do that? And just be, like, learning how to pour out an honest, heartbroken song before the Lord or, or even for my own heart. It was an incredible, an important journey. And finding my own song outside of my own sound, I would, I would even say, outside of typical church Music, like it just it was a season of discovery and you know exploration. I don't think you have to walk away from God to go on that. <laughs> okay, so don't hear me advocating rebellion so you can find your honest sound. I, I think that you can go, you can go on a journey of just going like, hey, Lord, you've made me, you've wired me, and I I wanna I wanna touch the sound that you have put inside of me, even though it may not be the sound that's seeming having to have a lot of weight. 
you know, in the realm of worship. It may be something new. Please explore that. Please, please go after that. Please learn, uh, learn your own language before the Lord before you try and, you know, learn everybody else's language. Like, it's just so important that you discover the way that your heart sings to the Lord. David did stuff that nobody, nobody did. He talked to the Lord in a way that nobody talked to. He had revelation that nobody stepped into. And, um, and so go on that season, allow the Lord to lead you, but, but give yourself some permission in a good way, in a holy way, to, to discover what God has put inside you. Don't immediately try and make it into a corporate monster hit, okay? That's, you know, see what the Lord has, and, and, uh, and, then, and then allow people in that process. Uh, it, this deep song, deep, deep song, deep thought, but uh, it's, it's, it means it takes a lot to unpack, and I don't necessarily have time, but that's, I'll just leave it at that. Yes. Um, just through like the leadership position that you've been in, um, how are you able to face sometimes the opposition that you have? Um, maybe with other team members, as you know the Lord is speaking to you and you know what He wants to do, but sometimes there's a difference in communication and retaliatory. Different cultures, different mindsets. Tension is always, always present. Uh, you never, ever have uh, moments without tension. I would say the most powerful tool I've had is meekness and humility. And um, that, 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 I, I say that because that's not my wiring. My wiring is to be edgy and abrasive. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to learn meekness. Meekness and humility to learn gentleness. Uh, I'm not saying I'm awesome at it. Saying that those are the most powerful ways to um, to navigate some of those moments, and there's moments where where the Lord increasingly, as you are faithful to what the Lord's called you to do, you begin to understand that the Lord is inviting you to step into more and more authority, and it's okay to walk in that authority, and to not be sheepish in that authority. The Lord's going to walk in that authority as well. There's times where you may be having a disagreement, um, uh, you know, or something, and again, you have to know what your level of trust is, which level. Authority is, but uh, so if you only have relational authority, all you can really do is appeal. But the Lord has entrusted you with a position to form culture, to shape worship culture, which starts first and foremost amongst your team and your musicians. That's where you have to guard that. And there's one thing we've been ruthless with, or I've learned, particularly over the past five years, I would say, is to be ruthless with the culture that you've established at the top and be like, we don't tolerate this, we draw lines in the sand. And we have drawn many, many different lines in the sand and be like, hey, when it comes to attitudes, I, I, don't, I don't let a bass player just simmer in a bad attitude for six months before I talk about it. <laughs> like, if we have Sunday and I'm like, you got an edge. Like, you're grumpy. And you're, you know, it's like that kind of thing. I'll find a way to navigate that, like, in the moment so we get through the set. But I'm going to sit down first thing, either after that set or Monday morning. I'm going to be like, hey, what's going on? What's going on? And sometimes it has nothing to do with me. That has nothing to do with the band. It's like, oh, I just had a brutal week, or I have this. But, but there's certain things where we protect that culture. And so as the Lord, but you can do that as a friend. You can do that relationally. You can do that you know, when you're not in power. So I'm speaking to two different postures. But I find, seek to understand, slow to speak, quick to listen, um, hear other people's hearts. But don't be afraid to walk out your convictions and, and, to, and to, to address some, you know, some things that, that feel weird. Brave communication is what we would, we would call it. And the world of worship needs brave communication. It needs stuff being out in the open. We don't let stuff simmer and fester. Um, we are so, we're the most highly offended people. <laughs> Creatives are the most sensitive offended people. Like we're just like hypersensitive to rejection and all that kind of thing. And so we have to live in that tension, walk in that tension, have a softness towards our brother if they get it's like when I tell someone to do something or change something, I know that they have to work through a little bit of rejection and a little bit of like, oh, that hurts a little bit. It's like you have to have compassion, but we have to have great communication. So, guys, it's technically maybe one more lightning question. Anyone have a lightning question? <laughs> Anything I should address here? These are, those are not lightning questions. <laughs> going once, going twice. Yes, ma'am. Can you just pray over the room? Yeah. Yes, I'd be delighted, delighted. 